Arvin. And uh, Philip. Hi, Arvin. We are a Hi. Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. 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 Great to see you. Yeah. It's, good good good. Good. Uh, it's been a long day. Yeah. <laughs> so let's sit down uh, right away and enjoy. Hi, hi, nice to see you. Uh oh. Oops, sorry. Hi, nice to see you. Hi, Ted. Hi, Philip. Hi, Ted. Hi, Ted. Hi, Ted. Hi, Ted. Hi, Ted. Hi, Ted. So um, uh, maybe a little bit of light on the audience and a tiny bit less per, uh, perhaps here up here, that would be great. So again, um, thank you for staying. And, and I think, first of all, another round um, of applause for that uh, amazing <laughs> Believe it or not, I think the original length will be three and a half hours, right? Uh, three and a half up to four. Though this was just an excerpt um, of the marvel um, of this uh, truly unique, um, uh, unique and um, and uh, um, and uh, exciting place. So maybe we start out very first. Um, the uh, question we called it uh, Arab classic plays. They are really well known. They are uh, sophisticated uh, works uh, of dramatists. How come they are not shown more, or not shown at all in the Western, Western world and Western theater? Well, are, oh, yes. Um, well, it's a complicated question, of course. And, and uh, I, I think the, the, the simplest answer really has to do with, uh, uh, with general cultural dynamics, that, that is, uh, uh, it's not just the, the Arabic theater, but, but uh, uh, Arabic culture generally for a long time, this is not, not a current problem, but it's a problem that goes back for decades, for centuries really, that Europe has looked upon the Arab world as a, a kind of strange other place that, that you can make up fairy tales about and you can, uh, uh, you, you can enjoy as a kind of semi-mythic place, but it's not, it's not a real place that, uh, that you feel any particular obligation to understand. And that, that has, that's carried on through um, uh, in, in, in politics, in economics, in, in, uh, and, and in the arts as well. Uh, Finally, today, we are becoming more aware of and interested in uh, the, the, uh, the Arab world, but it's a very slow process, and it's a, uh, uh, it, 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 it requires the overcoming of generations, centuries of indifference or outright prejudice that that's th 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 that's an enormous hurdle to overcome and i would add that um, i mean the, the arab world is the object of analysis it doesn't speak for itself it exists to be spoken about so um, while you know in, in any university you can find multiple political science courses or history courses that present an interpretation of the events of the middle east it's very rare that you're going to encounter the voices of people in the Middle East about those events. And certainly, you're very unlikely to encounter the artistic practices or the literature of that region. 
Uh, the, the Arab world exists to be spoken about, not to speak itself. I mean, I would just add, um, I mean, I'm representing the Sundance Institute Theater Program, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the opposite of an expert on this. Uh, I don't know what the opposite of an expert is, a neophyte. Um, Marvin is really the person that knows this world, but um, having entered the world uh, maybe five or six years ago, and we are in the midst of a, a long-term initiative to engage with um, artists writing in Arabic, that's our criteria. Um, when I first went to Beirut and Amman and um, Cairo and Tunisia and, and Morocco and met with artists and saw the work, when you ask artists in the region what they think of America, there were two answers. Uh, America is the great destroyer and America is the great hope. So there's a sort of schizophrenic relationship with America. I can't really speak for Europe, but for the America for sure. Most of the artists that we have begun to engage with really had never met American theater makers. Um, so it became sort of our, um, our mission, if you will, that we were going to connect people, um, kind of a bridge between those two cultures. And that's what we've begun to do and we continue to do. Um, but I, I do agree that you know, all the maps of the world are made by European or American or white colonialists Periodists. That's the way we've seen the world, and so what you've said is exactly right. Um, and that is hopefully beginning to shift a little bit, you know, at least in this country there are a few organizations that are committing themselves to um, finding ways to be truly cross-cultural and, and to under, I mean, I, and I feel like I'm just beginning that journey myself. I'm working with contemporary young emerging playwrights, so it it's behooves me to begin to understand this body of literature. And I sat today reading um, the book you edited on Wanus, which was really extraordinary. Um, and then to be here tonight as well. So um, it's an early part of a journey for me, but I just agree with you both. Um, I'd, I mean, this is my also analysis of it. And yes, and to all of that. It's just that I also believe that not only that the Arab world has been l like looked at to be for, for the West or other parts of the world to observe or, or take things from, but at the same time is that I don't believe there's a formalized theory for Arabic storytelling. Arabic storytelling has been around for a long time. People have been in public spheres telling stories, but unlike other parts of the world, like San Sanskrit theater or no, or even what Aristotle did with the Western world, no one said, like, or at least no one had written a formalized theory about what that kind of artistry is and giving it its own name and also writing. And if it does exist, it doesn't exist in a way that's translated to other parts of the world of letting people know that this is the origin of Arab theater. This is the indigenous art form of theater in that part of the world. So, yeah. I just want to say, I was just in uh, Germany uh, last fall um, we're going to do a, a, a playwriting lab with um, newcomer Syrian artists, uh, playwrights that are in the European Union. We're going there in May, in a week actually. And even now in Germany, the without thinking about it, I'm sure there is um, an impulse to expect that the Syrian writers are going to write about the war. And when you speak about to the Syrian playwrights, many of them will say, "I, I don't feel like I have the ability to." I've been here six years. I, I'm watching it on, in, on the internet like you are. I'm not even there anymore. So I don't actually feel like it's authentic for me, some of them will say, to, to write about it. And the expectation that was coming from Europeans, that that's the stories that they should be telling. And in fact, they're telling a huge range of stories from love affairs and personal stories and stories about their pets. And, 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 and many are writing, of course, about the journey west. But it, the expectations was interesting that, that Westerners think that this is the story we need to hear or that you need to write. So I, I think it perpetuates itself, that notion of, of coming from our you know, perspective. Um, Karim, a question for you. Do you think, how relevant are these plays for American audiences? Will, will they work? Yeah. Is it just that they're overlooked or? Well, I mean, I I'm really was responding a lot to what Philip was saying and what I'm hearing on the panel is that, uh, particularly when you're looking at uh, Producing these plays in America, if that's what we're really asking about, is sort of, we are so, at least in my perception as a Middle Eastern theater artist who's creating new work about the Middle Eastern experience, be that the Middle Eastern American experience or really what it's like to sort of 
live in the skin of an Arab or a Muslim. Uh, within the American theater, I really don't think there is even, there is the beginning of a Middle Eastern theater movement, but I think it's very nascent. I think it's very, very early. And as I often say when I, um, I'm asked questions like this, like we as, as creators of new work are still building a canon of work within the American theater, the work that Sundance is doing, uh, bringing voices from around the world, but it's, a, it's still a very new movement. So it's interesting when we look <laughs> at this deep, rich history of classic plays, it's I think very difficult for um, a, a Western audience to sort of even begin to access the past because they're so not even accessing the present and the, the, the way that the, a lot of the stories are sort of overly politicized, looking at a very specific facet of the Arab experience, it's still extremely limiting. So I think as the sort of canon of new work grows, I think um, both artists, like the artists that are generating the work, such as myself, and then other people will start to look into the history and, and sort of build that out more, which you can see happening in the Latino theater or in black theater, but not so much in the Arab theater because it's still a growing movement. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to uh, uh, build on that. I think, I, I think it's an extremely important point that, that um, um, they're, they're, well, actually, there, there, there are two th points that I think need to be made. One, one is it is very important to realize that uh, uh, although there really is a great deal, not nearly enough, but a great deal of interest over the last decade or so in, uh, uh, and Sundance is a major pioneer in this, not only in the Arab world, but in the, in, in, in the, the East African project. All, and and, and uh, there really is no other organization in the United States that has, has committed itself in the way that Sundance has to the, the degree of the geographical range. Uh, and there are other kinds of initiatives. We had here at the, uh, uh, at the Siegel Center, the uh, representatives from the Royal Court initiative a year or two ago, which is a smaller but similar kind of outreach. This is enormously important and enormously new work. People have not really done this until very recently. Uh, and what it is doing is absolutely invaluable, which is the encouragement of young playwrights in the non-Western world, uh, particularly in, in the Arab world and in Africa. Uh, and it's starting from, a, from a really kind of ground zero uh, and has more, become more and more sophisticated about, uh, uh, as, as was suggested, helping these people find their own voice, not trying to come in as the teacher instructor of this is the way you ought to write a play. Um, a very, very difficult negotiation, really. It's, it's as difficult as the as as the subject of the last play, the 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 mass, who's going to be the master and who's going to be the flip flop, and what does that mean? Um, but it it is tremendously important, and it's going on. There's a lot of this in in Germany, indeed, as has been mentioned. Having said that, then I I I want to pick up on this this the general comment of we're still very early days doing this. But we're nowhere looking beyond the living young playwrights and the process of development. This is absolutely critical. But let's imagine that we were, say, Martians coming in and saying, well, OK, we really want to, f want to develop an international interest in and awareness of earth theater consciousness, but all we're going to do is talk about new playwrights. Forget about Shakespeare, Moliere, and, and the Greeks, and all that. Uh, that's what we've done, with, and that's what we continue to do with, uh, with, the, with the Arab world. Uh, and that's, that's why this is a, a modest attempt. One more point, I, I could go on and on, as you can tell about this, because it's something that, that, that I'm very concerned with. But it's a point that has to be made, and that is that the Germans are not too bad about this, uh, and the French are not too bad for, for in different ways, and the British are 
not as good, but okay. The Americans are hopeless. <laughs> They're hopeless. And by that, I mean, let's say, okay, what does it take to get from here to seeing plays from the Arab world, especially from the Arab classical tradition, being presented in New York? Well, ha ha. Uh, if we don't, if we don't, if the New York theater does not do Moliere or Schiller, how the hell do you expect them to do Wanus? Uh, this, we are such as a culture, so incredibly isolationist and ignorant of anybody else in the world, except maybe the British, as far as theater is concerned. We don't care about what's going on in the Russian theater today, or what's going on in the French theater, or what the German theater. Uh, the, the Arabs are so far out of our can that if we're not even interested in our neighbors, the people who have a great deal of culture in common with us, how can we expect our theater to go uh, stretch further and look at, at Africa or, or, uh, uh, or the Middle East? Uh, this is a part of it. I mean, I, I often despair of the America of American culture in its isolationism, and I just have to. I, I think this is a, an, an, at this point, almost insurmountable problem. We're chipping away at a glacier, but at least we're chipping away. But I do, I do not expect to live to see uh, the New York stage presenting any plays like this. Nor do I expect my children to live to see it. What's that? <laughs> Come back in 20 years, and we'll, we'll talk about it. No, but you know, it's interesting. I mean, I used to be the, the chair of the TCG, and, and um, TCG, Theater Communications Group, which is the umbrella organization for all the not-for-profit theaters, um, there was an, always this tension in that organization because we service, you know, 800, 850 regional theaters, small theaters. And the, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of artistic directors who even have the curiosity to think about programming uh, international work, much less classical Arab plays or what have you. It's and so we we begin to try to figure that out. If you're going to be working with these young emerging playwrights, you know, and you want to communicate their work to Western uh, audiences as well as audiences in their homelands and the diaspora, you know, you have to begin to educate and encourage the artistic leadership of American theaters to think beyond whatever small circle of of titles they think about and. Uh, you know, that's Since you bring up TCG, I have had a lifelong interest in Ibsen, and I volunteered 30 or 40 years ago to regularly monitor TCG and collect uh, programs from productions of the nonprofit theater of Ibsen in this country. When I started this, which was about 30 or 40 years ago, Every year I had dozens of play, Ibsen plays presented. That has steadily, steadily declined. So that every year now in the, in the regional theaters in this country, there will be maybe four or five Ibsen plays and they will all be Doll's House or Hedda Gobbler. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Just uh, uh, to go back um, to, to the Arab classic plays, and you say there is, of course, the, the, the complication of the reception of the audience, but couldn't the case be made that the dictator or the play with the flip-flop, like in the tradition of the theater of the ridiculous or of the back, isn't it a universal um, 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 message? We could, could be, would we know if they would, names would be changed? Could this come from a, a European or American? No, if. Let's say it was a European or a Mexican or an Argentinian playwright or, or, a, or a Congolese playwright. All of these countries have plays that are wonderful and totally relevant to us, but we're not going to do them. Relevance is not the problem. Uh, ignorance and isolationism is the problem. Um, and the question about uh, Arab theater, Arab theater, of course, also does rely on indigenous theater, on Hakavati or others. Still, um, it looks at the West in a way of the theater of the absurd or the ridiculous. Is that kind of a, a tension or is that, uh, uh, um, so it's a Western model almost uh, um, that it also is being used. Um, how is that solved uh, at the moment for in the contemporary playwriting, theater making? So I, I would just mention that, you know, uh, for example, when Yusuf Idris, uh, authored the famous collection of essays about um, 
uh, reinventing the Arab theater grounded in indigenous theater, or when we think about um, Sadal uh, um use of the Hekawati in his, um, yeah, in, his uh, manamanat, uh, in, in his theater's manifestos, I mean, the first thing to note is that they were all writing in the 1970s. It was all a kind of, um, in some ways, it was a, um, a backlash against the Arab Renaissance and the ideas of adopting uh, European uh, literary forms to create a new uh, Arabic vernacular. So uh, in, in some ways, it's a, uh, there's a historical moment where there is a rejection of um, thinking through um, European theater models as imported and a desire to imagine them as um, connected to indigenous traditions. Um, but um, in point of fact, um, you know, Wanus in that same collection of theater manifestos has a beautiful essay about Brecht. So in fact, um, it is a syncretic for art form. Um, and um, Wanus and others um, subsequently um, uh, ceased to use that vocabulary. Um, even in North Africa with the Masra Tafadiya and the, um, and the uh, Ithifaliya, uh, tradition, the, the festivalizing of theater. Um, you know, they're more recent. I mean, what, what's really exciting right now in Morocco are the theater collectives, and the it's very much a director's theater. Um, and so um, there really is a kind of historical moment where um, the question of origins is of particular importance. Um, but I, I don't know that that's a really relevant question at the moment for the theater makers. Um, so, uh, I mean, to kind of circle around, I mean, in some ways, I just, I'm not sure that, I, I think the question has a kind of historical significance. Um, I don't know that the question really informs what, what the different companies are doing at the moment. It, it, it I, I, I think, I'm sitting here thinking, I, it sounds like I'm, I'm just preaching hopelessness, but, uh, I, I, it must be said uh, that uh, you're speaking of Wanus. Wanus was just produced at the Comédie Française. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is the leading theater in France. It would, we don't have anything quite like this, but it would be sort of like Lincoln Center or BAM. I mean, some obviously big major theater, uh, and the Comédie uh, and the the uh, the French National Theater has also in in, in recent years. Uh, Produced Jalila Bakar, who is the one of the leading um, the, uh, playwrights in the Arab world. She's Tunisian, um, so it it is. It, the times are changing, and I think I, I I I'm I'm not terribly optimistic about the American theater and on this in this regard. But it's possible. I think the regional theaters are more likely to do it than New York. I, I but. Uh, but it is being done. It's not as though the West is is just not doing anything about this now. Yeah, and, and I'm not mistaken. The the Comédie, Comédie Française production was directed by Suleiman Al yes, right? So right. so it's a Kuwaiti, British Kuwaiti director who's taking it upon, and the Comédie is actually being responsible about about a voice, uh, the director's voice being of the region as well, which I think is really, really important. I mean, I just watched that, um, there's a very famous interview, I'm sure you know it, um, with Juan Nuss when he was very sick at the end of his life. It's on video, it's actually an extraordinary interview with him. And um, you know, he was obsessed at the end of his life with Israel and, and, and says in the early part of this interview that his whole life has sort of been a waste because of the, um, his having to deal with this sort of ongoing Israeli sort of presence in the world and what that has done. And now, you know, it's a completely different world politically. I mean, Israel's still doing what Israel's doing, but, but the, the artists are not, I don't think, except for the Palestinian artists perhaps, obsessing in the same way that when news was obsessing about Israel. There are other issues now, issues of mobility and, and issues of, um, you know, not being able to live in their own, well, Syrians, for example, not being able to live in their own countries, many of them, although there are playwrights and there are directors and theater makers working in, in Damascus and other places in Syria right now. But the, you know, the political situation has changed as well, which has changed the, the story making, I think, too. So, you know, and everything's, the velocity of everything is so different right now. Even when you hear um, one new speak, and that was like 1997, you know, like 2017, it's a different world for all of those artists, completely different world. So I think that's really influential as well. 
should be maybe since we are a little bit a uh, uh, press of time, now we would go on a little bit. But I, I would really like um, also to ask uh, um, our audience, and we have such such a good audience here today. And again, thank you all for coming. But also, I was impressed by the numbers today, and also the the interest. So, um, uh, some comments or remarks or uh, questions um, um, towards the panelists or, or about the place. Yeah, we, we do record it also live streaming, so we will give you the microphone and... Well, uh, I'll betray my ignorance, but I, I find the rubric uh, classical Arab theater confusing from the point of view of the plays I saw today. Well, I, I didn't really know much about Arab theater, but it seemed to be the material and the format was uh, quite modern. So uh, when I think of classic theater, I think of Sophocles, Shakespeare, Schiller, and Goethe. What, what is the uh, advantage of, of, uh, of that genre, of that nomenclature, as calling it classical Arab? And what, what would be classical Arab theater in parallel with the classical Western theater? A white theater of well, Renaissance or something of that sort? Glad you asked that because uh, uh, I've been pushing for a number of years for the for more attention to be played to, paid to uh, Ibn Daniel, who wrote in the 13th century and wrote three plays that have been preserved that are better than anything anybody in Europe wrote for the next 200 years. Do we know him? No, that's my point. Um, uh, but it, even though there, there, uh, there is, and there's a, a continuing performance tradition. Uh, but uh, your point is well taken. That That is, uh, uh, there are these odd exceptions, but the fact is that uh, the European idea of theater, the European model of theater, really didn't get started in the Arab world until until the late 19th century. It's It was brought in by colonialism. The British, the French, and others brought in their style of theater. And so, uh, although in, in different parts of the Arab world it developed in different ways, uh, if we think of theater in the Western sense, this is from the late 19th century on. And so, uh, when, when we're talking about the classical Arab theater, what we essentially mean is the, 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 the flowering of that theater in the mid, uh, mid 20th century, from say around 1920 to 1960 or 70. Uh, but that, it, it's, it's, a different, uh, you, you, it's a different time scale we're working with. Thank you. Another question or remark or? Well, yeah, we, we're gonna give you the mic, one second. Right, I'm just interested in the marvelous play we just heard. How was that received in Egypt? Um, from, sorry, yeah, from, from my recollection, the play was not received well, and um, it, was, it was banned. I just don't know exactly what year it was banned, but I know, going back to what you were saying, that Europe has, the West, like Europe West, has showed interest in in those playwrights and those works early on. So um, so I believe Idris actually had his play staged somewhere in Germany a year after it had been banned from Egypt. That's, that's what I remember. Maybe the timeline is not exact, but, um, but yeah, the play was politically was not received well. Um, and Idris had to take it out, like he took it out to Europe to produce it. That, was that during Nasser? That yeah. Was yeah. 67, just before the war. Yeah. yeah the, the play was written in 1963. Oh. Um, yeah, Idris is the only one out of this canon of playwrights that wrote that play a few years before the, the Arab defeat. But, um, but yeah, the, the tension with the Nasser regime has been happening. It, like, it's, it's started really showing its oppressive teeth like in the early 1960s. 
I mean, the, the issue of censorship is also worth talking about um, because it still exists in many of the countries that we're talking about. Um, I know in Lebanon, for example, there, there are censors and they come to read your script and make decisions about whether or not you're playing. And then there are a lot of uh, Lebanese artists who work around that and go ahead forward even when the censors tell them they can't. But it's real and there have been people who are in Lebanon um, imprisoned as well um, for new work. So I think, I don't know the history of the decades, but I do believe that the censorship issue has existed in all of these countries at some point, sometimes more strictly than others, and so that has really inhibited um, a lot of people. I mean, it, 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 it is inhibited, but, but uh, 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 my wife, who, is, who majored in Spanish literature, uh, quote, used to quote a, a professor of hers who was a big Cervantes fan saying, all the best literature has been written in prison. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the, uh, it, I, I, it, this is not entirely ironic. I mean, it, it, the, it, certainly it is true that, that uh, uh, although it comes and goes almost always throughout the Arab world, there's been a continuing problem with censorship. Uh, but it is also true, and obviously the things are connected, that as a whole, and, and I, I must just quickly say parenthetically, we're, we, 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 we're all falling into the, the trap we all fall into to talk about the Arab world as though it's all one thing. The way we talk about it, it would be like if we said the European theater, as though there was really no difference between Great Britain and, and Latvia or wherever. Uh, so we must remember that. Having said that, though, uh, it still is true that Generally speaking, throughout the Arab world, the theater is political, it, it, at least in the most general sense. And I think today shows that very clearly, that, that even if the play is not directly talking about some political figure, it's always talking or almost always talking about power relationships in, in a way that, let's say, very few Western traditions as consistently do. That may be another reason why it, it doesn't export so easily. It's relevant, but uh, there are not a great deal. I mean, just look at the, look at the tradition of American playwright, playwriting. We're very interested in dysfunctional families. We're not very interested in power relationships. I mean, of course, there are exceptions, but this is really the rule in, in Arab in Arab playwriting. Yeah, and just anecdotally, um, this play, when it was produced in Egypt, it was actually produced on the National Theater, which is a theater that belongs to the government. So there's that tension of, like, the government around that time was producing art, but at the same time, a play like this would go on. But the thing I would like to add to what Marvin had said is that most of the Arab writers around that time relied heavily on symbolism and allegory. So while most plays were not directly talking about something that's necessarily happening now politically, but there is always, always that burning political symbolist allegory that they always, that always comes out in those scripts. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because in almost every country, I believe, um, there has, a, has been at some point or still is a national theater that's state supported and then there are the independent artists and it becomes very tricky, especially right now, um, when you go into a country and meet the artists to be aware of the various sort of factions and where the funding is coming from. And, you know, Sundance is indie, right? So we only work with independent artists and we have to learn, even if you go to Jordan, you know, um, there's a kingdom. Um, and the you know, Jordanian Royal F Jordanian Film Commission funds the laboratory you know that Sundance is engaged in doing with young filmmakers has done incredible work, but there are filmmakers who will not work with us in that mm. or did not work with the film. You know, so there's a it's a huge learning curve. But I also wanted to mention around censorship that um, we were very fortunate last month. Um, the Kennedy Center had invited us to. Uh, present two works from Palestine that we had developed at Sundance. And um, it was kind of amazing to be at the Kennedy Center, that giant edifice, mm -hmm. um, for four sold out performances of two plays by Palestinians. Um, and the Palestinian artists themselves were 
deeply moved that they were in the capital where you know our current president is a half a mile away and it was theater from Palestine and it was a play about you know one about um, both were about the return return to to Palestine and um, they were profoundly moved and it was sold out and it was American audiences coming to one of the plays was in Arabic with uh, subtitles mm -hmm. so I was I mean it was a small version of it but it gave me a little bit of hope that there were Americans living in DC theater goers that were incredibly curious and loved hearing the stories that were being told. It, it, yes, this, this is a, a, a very important contribution, I think. And one must add to that that uh, uh, a number of years ago, as you know, the uh, the Kennedy Center had a program, or not a, had a festival called Arabesque, right. uh, in which they had a uh, one of Solomon Al Bassan's plays, the first the first uh, first one done in this country, first first. Arab play done in a major major professional theater in this country, and also they had a, a secondary play by Jalila Bakar, the Tunisian I mentioned. So uh, there, these have been, and they were very well attended yeah. and very well reported on in the media. Not that it has anything to do with censorship, but we got signals from our uh, CUNY security censored. in uniform. And Censored right now, aren't we? Uh, and we are over yeah, time. Normally we have to be out at 9.30. We already went a little bit over time. Uh, thank you also, Joy, you know, for putting this together. And uh, also um, um, for you to be dramaturg on all three uh, plays. The theater is uh, alive. There is a scene. Please do check out our upstage as it shows what is going on. There is a great tradition. They also... Lila Bach, there's the North Theater here. So um, it is truly a wonderful, uh, great field of theater we really do not know about. And in New York City should take uh, uh, attention to this. As we all know, over 50% of everybody living in New York City is no longer white. It is not reflected on the stages. It's not reflected in our cultural uh, um, context. And this is a contribution. And also, uh, it, it enriches our lives and, uh, and to see uh, how questions of form and content are being solved by the by the writer. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you for coming and sitting all here. And, and thank you as an audience uh, for, for, for being with us. And now we have to move on super fast. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.